everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over hyperparathyroidism. In the previous video I went over hypoparathyroidism, so be sure to check that video out so you can compare these two conditions. So what I want to do in this video is I'm going to go over the causes, the patho, the signs and symptoms, and the nursing interventions and cover the things specifically you need to know for NCLEX and your nursing lecture exams. And after you watch this video, be sure to go to my website, registerednursern.com, and take the free quiz that will test your knowledge on hypoparathyroidism versus hyperparathyroidism. And a card should be popping up so you can access that video. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about what is the definition of hyperparathyroidism? What is this condition? It is an excessive secretion of PTH, parathyroid hormone, by the parathyroid gland. And whenever this happens, the patient will present clinically with hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. So why are they presenting with a high calcium and a low FOS level? Why is PTH causing this? Well, let's look at the negative feedback loop of how um, the parathyroid works to regulate your calcium levels along with your FOS levels. Now your parathyroid gland is found in your neck behind the thyroid gland. And this pink area is your thyroid gland. And these little green areas are your parathyroids. You have four of them. And what happens is that it is stimulated whenever your body has a low calcium level in the blood. A normal calcium level is 8.6 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. So whenever it drops below 8.6, the parathyroid gland says, hey, we need to release some PTH, parathyroid hormone, so we can increase our calcium levels. Now, PTH is released and it acts on the kidneys and the bones. So let's talk about how PTH affects the kidneys. Whenever the kidney sense PTH is being released by the parathyroid gland, it causes the kidneys to reabsorb calcium. And that increases calcium levels. But it also causes the kidneys to excrete phosphate. So if you have a lot of parathyroid hormone being secreted, you're gonna have a lot of calcium being absorbed by the kidneys, and you're gonna be excreting lots of phosphate, which is why you're getting hypercalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. Now, another thing, the kidneys also, whenever it senses the PTH, it activates vitamin D. What does vitamin D do? In order to absorb calcium in the body, you have to have vitamin D. So you're having a lot of vitamin D being activated. And this causes your small intestine to start absorbing lots of calcium from the food that you've been taking in. So you're increasing your calcium levels even more. Now, how does PTH affect, affect the bones? Okay, you have osteoclasts in your bones. And what PTH does is it stimulates those osteoclasts. What do osteoclasts do? They break down bones, which causes bone resor resorption. And whenever that happens, your bones are breaking down, it's releasing calcium into the blood. So when you have lots of PTH, your bones are just majorly depleting themselves of calcium. So you're gonna start seeing some bone problems, which we'll see here in a second on our signs and symptoms. Now, let's look at the causes. What causes this condition? Okay, there's two different little subsets of causes. You have primary and secondary. Okay, primary problems, let's talk about this. A primary problem is a problem with the parathyroid gland itself. So the issue is with the gland. And things that can cause this, non-cancerous adenomas, which is the most common, so you get an adenoma on one of these glands, it can cause the gland to mess up and over-secrete parathyroid hormone. Another thing is hyperplasia of the gland. This is one of those para parathyroid glands are enlarged. So when they're enlarged, they're over-secreting PTH. It's working overactively or a cancerous growth on the parathyroid. Now let's look at secondary causes. This is a disease that is causing the parathyroid gland to mess up. So really the parathyroid gland is working, but this disease is causing it to malfunction. So what can do that? One of the most common 
um, diseases is chronic renal failure. And what happens with, with this is that your parathyroid becomes overworked because think back to people who have renal issues. They're gonna have issues with reabsorbing the calcium, excreting the phosphate and things like that. And that's really, according to this, me this negative feedback loop, that's gonna mess up your um, parathyroid because it's gonna be sensing these low calcium levels because it's stimulated by low calcium levels. So your parathyroid is gonna become overworked and you're gonna enter into this condition. Another thing is just having hypocalcemia, just that over a long period of time, keep having those low, low calcium levels and this is gonna overwork the parathyroid again or the vitamin D deficiency. And remember, vitamin D helps us take in calcium and if we don't have enough vitamin D, we're not gonna be taking in calcium. So then that's going to overwork the parathyroid. So how is this patient going to look to you? What are those big classic signs and symptoms that you need to know for exams and NCLEX? Okay, the reason the patient is presenting with signs and symptoms of hyperparathyroidism is because of that high calcium level. That is what's causing our issues. So remember, what does calcium do? Calcium plays a role, a role in our bone health and it plays a role in our muscle and nerve function. So bone health is not going to be good um, because remember, we talked about how the bones, the osteoclast activity is really stimulated. It's gonna be breaking down bones, which is going to be causing calcium to be leaking out of your bones into your blood. So you're gonna be seeing a lot of bone issues like osteoporosis, bone fractures. And um, it plays a role in your muscle and nerve function, which will slow it down. So you're gonna be seeing some GI issues, things like that. So let's see what we're gonna have. Okay, bone fractures. Again, PTH causes that, that excessive breaking down of bones, which causes calcium to leak into the blood, and you're gonna have fragile bones. So you'll see patients with bone fractures. A calculi, this is renal stone formation. Why that? Well, you have the increased calcium level and the kidneys are absorbing the calcium. Plus these patients are becoming dehydrated because they're gonna have excessive urination. So they're definitely at risk of forming those stones. Another thing is constipation. Remember, calcium, excessive calcium levels slows down muscle contraction. And in the GI system, you have smooth muscles. So you're gonna slow down that muscle contraction. Um, Stool food is gonna stay in those intestines longer, it's gonna get hard, and patients are gonna become constipated. GI problems like nausea and vomiting, and this is usually due to the epigastric pain that they're having because calcium increases your gastrin acid levels, which will cause epigastric pain and make the patient feel nauseous and may have some vomiting. Also, frequent urination, excessive urination. Um, this is because of the increased calcium levels causing the kidneys to work harder then you're gonna get dehydration because they're peeing all the time. And then that's gonna concentrate your urine and that's gonna probably lead to um, renal stone formation. So it all goes hand in hand. And also there can be EKG changes if that calcium level gets low enough and um, you can get a short QT interval. That's one of the hallmark things you need to watch out for with a high calcium level, a short QT interval. So let's look at the nursing interventions. What do you need to do for this patient as the nurse? What do exams like to hit on? Things you need to know. Okay, so first, of course you want to monitor their vital sign, their EKG, strain their urine, watch their urine closely for any kidney stones, if they're having any flank pain, things like that, the typical signs and symptoms of that. Watch their calcium and phosphate levels, watch their intake and output, and encourage fluids as tolerated to keep their urine nice and um, diluted instead of concentrated because they're gonna have that frequent urination. Also, encourage a diet low in calcium because they have high calcium levels and high in false. However, if this is a renal patient, you want to watch their phosphate levels. They are a little bit different because they tend to keep phosphate. So they may actually have hyperphosphatemia with this. So you don't want to encourage a high phosphate diet in them. Treatments and medications as ordered by the physician. What can you expect as a nurse? What are things you have to watch out? What are your role? Okay, a typical treatment for especially um, the primary cause of hyperparathyroidism is a parathyroidectomy. And this is where they go and remove either the enlarged or the glands with the tumors on them to help correct the parathyroid so it can start to work better. 
With this, however, remember this stuff. You need to monitor the respiratory status. Why? Because of the nature of the surgical site and where they went in. So watch for any respiratory distress. Um, you're going to place them in semi-fowler's position. Why? Um, this position helps um, alleviate any strain they may put on the surgical site and um, with drainage and excessive swelling. Also, as an emergency, you want to have a trait kit at the bedside along with suction, oxygen, just in case the patient does go in respiratory failure. You need to watch calcium levels because um, they've messed with the parathyroid gland. There's um, chances that the patient could go into hypocalcemia. Um, so watch for low calcium levels, which would present with tingling, numbness, excessive twitching, a positive Trousseau sign, or Chabot stick sign. And we talked about that in the hyperparathyroidism video. Next, big thing, remember this. Because of the close proximity of the surgery with the uh, laryngeal nerve, watch for laryngeal nerve damage. And this would present with the patient having difficulty speaking, like their voice sounds hoarse or they have problems swallowing or, or talking, and you would want to notify the physician immediately of that. Okay, typical medications that you're gonna give this patient that's gonna be ordered by the physician. Okay, goals of our medications is to decrease the parathyroid hormone, decrease the calcium level because we have excessive amounts of that going on, and keep the patient hydrated. So what are we going to do? Um, one thing that physicians like to order, especially for patients with a secondary cause of hyperparathyroidism with chronic kidney disease, um, is calcium memetics. Also, one drug is called Sensipar, that's a popular one. And this works by mimicking the role of calcium and deceiving the parathyroid gland that there's enough calcium in the body. So the parathyroid gland is going to think that there's enough calcium in the body, so it's gonna quit releasing so much parathyroid hormone. And remember this, mimics, and part of the word calciminics is M-I-M-E-T-I-C, and remember that with the function in case you're asked that. Okay, so what does it do? Once this patient takes it, it will decrease the PTH, it will also decrease their calcium levels and decrease their phosphate levels. Because remember, like I said earlier, patients with renal issues have issues with high phosphate levels. So this medication will help all three of those and help keep their calcium nice and regular. Um, you would want to give this medication with food. Okay, another type of medication that's usually prescribed is calcitonin. This is given by either injection or nasally. It's um, Calcitonin is actually naturally produced by your thyroid gland and how this is going to work is it's going to lower your calcium levels and suppress that osteoclast activity. So it's going to prevent those bones from breaking down and it'll cause your kidneys to excrete that calcium. So you're going to lower those calcium levels and protect those bones and help build them back up. Another thing prescribed is loop diuretics like Lasix. How this works is it helps decrease calcium le levels by inhibiting calcium resorption in the renal, renal tubules. However, you want to watch their potassium levels with this. Another thing that can be prescribed are bisphosphates, um, some popular ones, um, Aredia like Pamadronate, or Falsamax, also called Alendronate. And how these work is that they like to protect the bones from losing calcium by slowing down that osteoclast activity, which breaks bones down, and increasing the osteoblast activity, which actually builds the bones up. However, there's something you want to remember about Falsamax. I would totally remember this, very important. Um, take, have the patient take Falsamax on an empty stomach by itself with no other medications with a full glass of water and have them set up for at least 30 minutes after taking it. And the whole reasoning behind this is because Fosamax is hard on the stomach and the esophagus and it can cause severe ulcers. So that is the reasoning for that. And have them wait at least 30 minutes before taking vitamins or antacids. So that is about hyperparathyroidism. Now go take that free quiz on my website, registerednursrn.com, and be sure to check out this other endocrine series for NCLEX reviews. And thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.